Welcome to the Sense of Soul podcast. We are your hosts, Shannon and Mandy. Grab your coffee, open your mind, heart, and soul. It's time to awaken. Today we have this Dr. Stacy Berman. She is not only a doctor in natural medicine, but she is a shaman of the Hopi tradition. She is a movement and somatic specialist, sex expert, a Reiki master. She is trained in bioresonance, analysis of health, ACMOS method, and a compassionate inquiry practitioner. I am so excited to talk to Stacy. I know she's going to bring so much wisdom. So thank you, Stacy, for being with us. Hey, how are you? I am good. Well, is there such thing as like a, a spa day hangover? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I had a massage and a facial like late last night. And I've like been in like this la-la land ever since. <laughs> <laughs> It was great. <laughs> I've been in Croatia for the last month and I leave back to New York on Thursday, but it's been pretty amazing because it is, it's like an extended spa day hangover because it's like, all I did today was I went to the beach. I mean, I had one glass of wine and I'm like, why am I so tired? <laughs> <laughs> so that I assume it's not morning where you are. <laughs> no, no, no. It is 6 p.m. where I am. <laughs> oh, okay. How is Croatia? What's that like? It's amazing. This is my third trip to Dubrovnik, and it's just beautiful. The ocean, I mean, look, I'm. Sure, let's see. Can you see out the window? That's oh, the ocean wow. right there. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Food is amazing. People are so friendly. I mean, ocean, the sea, the land, everything is just amazing. So, and then you said you, you're going to go back home to New York? New York. Yes. Yes. On Thursday. So it'll be a rude awakening. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. But go from that to the busy, huh? To all the people, exactly. all the things. I was just looking at your website and you know, it's really funny. The picture with you sitting in the midst of all of the, the chaos is what I would say. <laughs> well, it's funny because the idea behind that photo shoot, because I have a few like that, I titled Calm in the Chaos. So it worked. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's exactly what spoke to me. You know, one time I was, we live in Colorado. I was at the Denver International Airport, which is a busy airport as well. And there was this, no, I'm lying. It wasn't. I had went to New Orleans and okay. it was like, I think I want to say it was Mardi Gras oh, gosh. and it was really, really super crazy busy. And there was this guy on the ground because it was probably, he probably got bumped or something. You could tell he'd been there a while and he was meditating right. in the midst of everyone at this airport. And it was like before, I mean, I think I was only like 18 then. And yeah, 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 yeah. I remember thinking, oh my God, like, is he sleeping? I didn't even get what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, wow. And you know, I have not, you know, full gotten in pose or anything, but in yeah. situations that yeah. are highly stressful, just kind of closing my eyes and connecting, taking a deep breath, reminding yourself to breathe. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, you know, the major thing when I work with people, obviously each individual story is unique, but I would say that a lot of it boils down to being disconnected from the self. And so moments like that, where, you know, let me just check in with my breath. How am I breathing? And maybe not even doing anything about it, but like, how am I taking deep breaths? Am I taking shallow <laughs> breaths? Just little things like that. Or like, how does, can I feel my feet on the floor? Can I feel my, you know, butt sitting on the chair? Like little things like that help people really to get back in touch with what's going on in their body instead of, you know, avoiding by just being in the head all the time, which is very common. So powerful. <laughs> so power. Just those little tiny things are so powerful. You know, I sometimes will catch my youngest daughter, I have kids from 25 to 10 wow. and every once in a while I'll catch her, you know, she'll be playing a game or something on her iPad and I'll catch her go. <sighs> and I'm like, Oh, that is so good. Yes. You know? Yes. That buildup needs somewhere to yep. go. Yep. Yeah. 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 
one of my first teachers kind of on this path, he's a Siddha master of the Tamil tradition, so Southern India. And one of the things that we did was we worked with kids and meditation and breathing and sounds. And we had the opportunity to work with some scientists to like study the brain and how it was affected by these things and how it was affected at such a young age. And it was so profound to see like how it developed, helped the nervous system develop. And that was like 20 years ago. So now to see how that impacted That's them exactly. over the long term. Yeah. So it's amazing. That's such important work. We're just so conditioned to think this is so you know, far out there, you know, so right. woo -woo. I'm like, right. no, really not. These are very old techniques. This is not new as a new exactly. age. This is old age. And right. there's a lot of science that, you know, right. backs up almost all of the energy work and, and who we are right. as multidimensional beings. Exactly. Yeah. For my kids having different span of generations, yeah. Right, I've got Gen Zs, and I've got. Uh, well, actually, they're even like at the end of millennials, my oldest, and then now I have this new Gen Alpha, and she's so different. And I get that I am right. a different mom too. Right, but right. the world is different. It's less conditioned. You know, there's less hustle. Well, right. I still see hustle outside of me, but less hustle in right. my life, which has made a difference in her life. Right, right. I'm really interested to see how, like, what with COVID and everything over the long term, just like facial recognition and things like this. Yeah. And yeah, we had someone on not too long ago that threw out some statistic that kids were like one and two were stressed or depressed since 2020. Wow. In many ways, it validated and made me feel a little better that it wasn't just my kid. <laughs> right, then, right, 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 right. Yeah, Overall, you know, in a collective, that is so sad. They're going to have some PTSD for sure. For sure, for sure. And like the things that I do in terms of character structure and character armor and facial recognition is like, that's one of the first languages that child and baby start speaking before language, before anything. It's like the baby and the mom look at each other and they get a sense of it and they're able to mirror each other. And this is like, this is not oh. just like, oh, hugging you. I feel so good. It's no, your baby is actually learning how to recognize the emotions of the mother and then the other caregivers and then the family. And it's called interpersonal neurobiology. And that's where it starts the face and the nervous system. This started for Kinsley and she's very introverted. So it was really difficult yeah. for her. It's really pushed her back. You know, she regressed with yeah. that. It started at the end of her second grade year and all of third and then, you know, some of fourth. And I remember her, one of her teachers calling me and saying, is she doing okay? Because I can't tell. If she's sad, is she happy? Right. She's right. like, I can't, it's so frustrating. I can't see. She goes, I didn't realize how much I, you know, could look at them and say, oh, they got it, you know, or they right. don't got right. it. And especially with someone right. like Kensley, who's so quiet, will not say like, hey, I don't get this. Right. Last year at the beginning there was real bad. I mean, I can honestly tell you my nine-year-old was depressed, you know, fatigued and yeah. didn't want to go to school, didn't want to do anything. And now it seems like since maybe spring, things have been perking up and I'm like, right. hey, she seems like a kid again. That's good. Then one of the other positives about it is that the children are still, their nervous systems are still quite flexible. Yeah. So with the right inputs, hopefully that's, you know, they're able to readjust knock on wood. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting time. It's like that fear <laughs> and yet they don't even really know what they're in fear of necessarily, you know, like their fear of death. But then it was like, you know, Ukraine, you know, we think that our kids don't know. <laughs> of course they know. I mean, they, yeah. first of all, they know more than any generation prior. They've got their phones right here, 24 hours, right. TikTok or whatever. They right. know before I do because I don't right. watch videos. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it is. I mean, and also besides that, it's like outside of the amount of information that they have access to also that kids are not hypersensitive. They're sensitive to the feel of energy around them. And when I mean that, I am not, again, not talking about like woo woo stuff. I'm like, like the electromagnetic mm -hmm. fields of people, they're very sensitive. And I think through conditioning, as we become adults, that part gets shut off. 
not with everyone, but it, it dulls down a bunch. And so kids outside of the information that they're receiving, also they're very aware of like wow. all the inputs going on. And so, wow. so multi-layered, okay. you know? So I have, I have a proof for that one. So we just got a puppy not too long ago. Okay. So Mandy and I both got puppies. They're from okay. the same litter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they both have ear infections, unfortunately. But so I have a son who just graduated and he's autistic. So we have two dogs. We have a mini Labradoodle and now we have a ginormous puppy Labradoodle. <laughs> okay. But they, the first dog, our first dog, Rascal, used to always attack Ethan's ankles. And Ethan would be like, ah, I'd be freaking out, freaking out and did this for years. So when we get the new puppy, the new puppy starts doing it. And I'm like, oh no. And I said, Ethan, close your eyes and pretend your legs are of steel. He hardly has any ego, I'm telling you. So he, right, right. I tell him these things and they work for him so right. good. So he closes his eyes and he's like, legs of steel. And he walks like a transformer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and do you know that dog stayed far away from his ankles? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Dog was so, like, yeah, yeah. don't mess with and him. <laughs> he does it every time. So he'll re- I can see him like reset and remind himself legs of steel. And he starts walking through the living yeah, room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. It and that's exactly it. Right. It's like, cause nothing has changed outside of the intention and the like vibratory field of energy that's transmitting information to the dog. Right. <laughs> Right. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. That that same thing happened with him his freshman year. He would go into the hallway and his legs would come home sore because they would shake because he'd be so nervous. So so sad. Right. But we did arrange it because he he was he's supposed to get out just a little bit before so he doesn't have to deal with the crowd because that's definitely on his IEP. And I and actually I do this in my classes where we walk towards each other and sense each other's field by putting our hands yep. up. And yep. then I'll have them put some sort of like protection around them. And then yep. I'll walk towards them. And you yeah. can literally feel this yeah. resistance. And so he went to school that day. I, and I said, you know, we imagined whatever he could visualize. I forget what it was. I think it was fire or something. And it worked for him. He was so confident. But it's yeah. like... All of our thoughts and conditions keep us in this box to say that that's not possible. Right. I mean, that's a beautiful, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you know, or maybe you do, but just to mirror that back to you, that's exactly a boundaries exercise. So anyone who has had boundary issues and, and people like, yeah, so that's, I mean, that would be, that is literally an exercise I've done with people who have boundary issues. And like, we start where I'm standing on one side, I'm standing and they're standing on another side. And I ask, can I come closer? Yes. One foot, two feet, three feet, how many? And then when I get to a point where they're like, that's too close. And then I start can moving can I move this way. Can I move that way? And it's, it's really, it is a way for the person to start feeling what their own energetic boundary is. And then, you know, of course there's a physical boundary, but they're different. And that's, quite interesting and I mean even one of my clients <laughs> was walking is this too close is this too close yeah. <laughs> I'm like right here he's like closer I was like okay you have boundary issues <laughs> that is so funny. but yes you're so right because as someone comes closer to you you know that feeling like you're in my space we're right. you're in my space right now back up I can't even see you because I'm farsighted <laughs> <laughs> you're way too close but you can feel it in your body and I think that that's yeah. something that we all should know is is exactly. what it feels like in our body when our body's saying that's too much this too is much. not this yeah. is not a yes this is yep. a no yeah you know? another exercise which again you can play around with if you want to work uh Ethan you said is your son's yeah. name mm-hmm. yes. with Ethan there's a practice also that one can do where because of course a boundary like if you have let's say you have you know, six foot boundary around you is beautiful. But if you get into a crowded place that that boundary may not be possible. So there's an, you mm. can actually then, if you are able to focus that and then energetically pull it in to your core. So the boundary is still there energetically. Mm. You've just contained it a little closer to your physical body. And it still has that same feeling of, oh, but this is my boundary. 
And then of course you could let it out and, and like just practicing with that to see what that feels like. I actually worked with someone who had autism and it was, she was quite sensitive. And as she described it, she picked up so much energy from outside of her that as she was describing it, she thought she was dissociating from herself. So that was a practice that we did of, okay, so you have this field of energy that you could feel everything out here. Now let's bring it closer in and in. And it helps her to drop it inside of herself. Obviously, I don't know, Ethan, but just some idea. I actually was thinking about my daughter, that. who's an introvert. And, and you know, yeah. and, and maybe you can explain this. I mean, it's hard, I think, sometimes for people to understand all this stuff, because what we're talking about is it's basically information that is exactly. coming in as in, into our fields. And exactly. it can come in from all different directions, depending on how, you know, how strong that information is around you exactly. and heavy or, you know, yeah. all of these things. Right. And exactly. a dog is, you know, rah, 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 you know, <laughs> you know and fear, right? Right. And all of that. And think about Kensley. One time she had said to me, because she's very sensitive to um, sound. Like I would almost say, I've said before, she's got like mesophonia. Like mm. it drives her crazy. And one day we had a talk about it. And I was so glad that she was so raw and open with me. She goes, It's torture. It's so hard. It hurts. You know, mm. and I just was thinking, oh my God, that's so sad. Like, it, this isn't just an annoyance. Like, she's actually speaking about pain that she's experiencing. Mm. You know, how are you supposed to learn, right? How are right. you supposed to focus on following directions right. when, you know, your focus is around those things? And of course, this is something physical that would maybe be more difficult. You may need something over your ears or something. Right. Right. But, you know, and she's, she's sensitive inside and out. And this was something that I've, right. you know, you know, she's 10, so we're putting it all together, but you know, she gets reactions on the, her skin from stress reactions also from like cold and temperature, it's just everything. This child is like, so yeah. in every way and right. like trying to get her to accept that about herself and still love it. Mm give him tools to be able like you were just saying to control yeah. these things yeah and I think I mean again she's 10 so it's maybe hard right now but I do think that a sensitivity to energies around you and your senses is actually a beautiful gift it's just a matter of you know like learning to work with them instead of against them questions of like well what is and again she's younger so you don't know how this would go down but what does she not want to hear what is painful for her to hear so like how these things manifest in physical right. form. So it's a manifestation of like, it's too, like she's hearing too much and it's she's yeah. too sensitive. So like, but maybe there's something again, not like a voice is speaking to right, her, right, but right. what is it trying to show her? Right. Because it's manifesting in a particular way because of She something. will get to know that though, right? And you know, through exactly. time you, start, you get to know your you know, your energy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know when this happens, I need to take a deep breath or I need, you know, exactly. something. And she's exactly. also been sensitive to like spirits and stuff like that. Always has been. I mean, this child is, you know, when I say sensitive all the way around, but, you know, I was wondering, like you came into this journey, this amazing journey, you know, you know, creating yeah. things for people that were maybe even unheard of back in the day. I mean, like, Mm-hmm. And out the outdoor boot camp and stuff when that wasn't really yeah. a thing. So yeah. were you like that as a child? Were you sensitive? So so funny. I, I was very, very sensitive. Um, and I even remember before boot camp and all that stuff. <laughs> this is very embarrassing, but I'm gonna tell you. One of my <laughs> best friends and I, we would sneak out when we were like 13, 14, we would sneak out of our house and I would say I was sleeping over her house. She would say she's sleeping over my right. house and we would like Uh-oh. go hang out and stuff. <laughs> and like, I remember yeah. one day we, we went to get pizza and there were those little, you know, salt and pepper shakers. And we each took salt and pepper shakers and put different spices and put our hair <laughs> in it. And then we wore it as jewelry, which again, oh, is very cool. embarrassing. <laughs> but what we, uh, the reason I tell you that is because we called each other the season sisters. And then someone in my neighborhood saw that and she called me a witch, but oh. I think she, she was, she was trying to insult me, but I was like, 
thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I, I share that only because there was, yes, I've always been more sensitive or not more sensitive. I've just been sensitive emotionally, physically to the energy around me. Like I could walk in and I could tell, okay, this person is sad. This person is happy. This person I'm staying away from. <laughs> yeah. And so it was just that kind of stuff that I've always been connected to I guess you could say yeah yeah, yeah. for sure and you, I was like you I, yeah. I was very raw and I felt like I was just soaking it all in like a sponge willingly yeah. taking you know I used to remember even praying that this person's pain would come to me instead mm, and mm, mm. because I just I couldn't bear to for them to have it you know which right. is so interesting but which caught up with me I mean I was diagnosed right. with myalgia and, <laughs> you know and all the things yeah <laughs> And so what did you do to work through You know it? what? I mean, I was on so much meds because of all this diagnosis. You know, I was like anxiety, fibromyalgia, ADHD, you got all these things, right? And I'm, we got a pill for this, pill for that, pill for that, you know? And then I was like, who am I? I couldn't cry. I was such a sensitive person. I was nitty baby my whole life. Then it was like right. someone told me someone died and I couldn't even cry. And I'm like, right. this isn't who I am. You know, my kids are on the roof and I'm like, hey. You guys might want to get down. I mean, like, I just was non-responsive, right. like naturally right. or normal. I was like a robot. What really hit it was my memory. I start, I always had a very good memory and I couldn't remember just like my day. Cause I, mm. I was, would have like four clients and then my day would end. And I'd be like, I don't remember not one. Mm. So I called the doctor that I was like, I'm freaking out. I can't remember anything. I think something else is wrong with me now. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and, <laughs> right. and at first I was like, you need to give me another pill for this, right? Which my B12 right. was always low. My B12, I've always struggled with. Okay. I did, I got off of all the meds and I said, I'm going to go to therapy to figure out what it is that's wrong with me. Something's got to be wrong with me. But it okay. really wasn't that anything was wrong with me. I mean, seriously, Stacey, what was wrong with me is I had zero tools, zero Exactly. <laughs> yep. I was stressed. Right. You know, I had four kids. Right. And my dad died right. and whatever. Or, I mean, you, you could see like where these diagnoses were popping up, where yeah. like, all of the major transitions in my life that instead yep. of honoring those deaths, right, and acknowledging them, I just wanted to not feel. Yeah. I mean, that's what I. It, tell people too like it's that if you have if you are depressed or if you are anxious and I would say if you are sick even I mean not with just like a regular cold and stuff but if there is something that is manifesting in your body that those are signs that something is not right and so better to examine where it's all coming from instead of trying to do a medication for I mean sometimes you do need medicine I'm not shitting on medicine but, <laughs> but with a tool right but with, but with tool. tools right like yeah. how do we understand what the root of this is I have for example one client she has eczema and as we started going through it we recognized where the root was from and also we look at it now as a sign because she she would be able to feel when she was going to have uh eczema, you know, rash come up. And so it was like, okay, so your system at this very moment is feeling unsafe. And so what can we do for your system to help it feel safe and to get regulated instead of doing all the medication? And, and yes, like, I mean, we used coconut oil and we did all that stuff, but that there are things that we can do to our nervous system to help shift that and to sh help shift how your body, how your nervous system is functioning and how your biochemical makeup is functioning outside of any medication. And if you need medication, okay, but let's look at what the root cause is first and help adjust that because that's where it's manifesting from. Yeah. Wow. So, so how did it go for her? So, I mean, now she's, you know, we're still working through it. She has tremendous trauma from childhood that we're working through. Um, but as we're working through it, we're going through a process of, okay, if I have an outbreak, 
that means my nervous system was feeling unsafe. There are mo- so nervous system can go from, you know, fight or flight, it could go into freeze, it could go into collapse. So based off of what she is experiencing in that moment would tell me, okay, you're in sympathetic overdrive right now, or you're in collapse right now. And so if I know where, where, what state you're in, then we can work to help you get help get you out of that state. And then also, yeah, and then we can examine, well, what got you into that state? Yeah, what triggered it? What triggered it? And so then it's really the story, right? It's it's not Mm -hmm. not the narrative of like, what happened? I went to the store and then this person said this. It's the story of our lives that's playing out in a pattern in our nervous system. And Mm -hmm. so if we can look at that pattern, then we can start giving the nervous system what it needs at each moment. If you're, if yeah. you're in sympathetic overdrive, your heart rate is going to be fast. You're going to be sweating. You're going to <sighs> shallow breathing. So, okay, you feel unsafe now. How do we get you into safe? If you're in freeze, okay, you're in numb now. So how do we get your nervous system to come back online? So we, and we do this, obviously, we don't want to go like straight in and overwhelm the system. We want to do what's called pendulate and titrate. So titration is basically a somatic experiencing term. And what it means is when you have, let's say a traumatic experience that you're working through, uh, you don't want to go straight into the deep end of it. You want to just little drop, little drop, little drop at a time so that each time you build up a little bit more resilience to entering that space. So how I kind of relate it in a way that people can understand is, let's say you've never worked out a day in your life. You don't start by running a marathon. You start, maybe you walk around the block. And then the next day, maybe you walk around, you know, two blocks and so on and so forth until you eventually get up to. You're building endurance, basically. Exactly. So you're building that capacity to hold (laughs) more with titration. And then pendulation is a process of going from a positive experience, an anchor experience, what I call an anchor experience or somatic experience and calls that, which is a positive experience where you feel safe or whatever elevated emotion you want to connect with. So that would be a process of like how we started out where that man in the airport was just meditating. So it might be, okay, well, take your place to take yourself to a beautiful place where you feel calm and relaxed and your system is feels whatever elevated emotion it wants to feel. And then from there, we might go a little bit into what that experience that's a little darker, heavier is. Mm -hmm. And then we go back and forth. It's like polarity, it's that duality that to find that Exactly, exactly. And what it does for the person, it it allows their nervous system to recognize that Mm -hmm. even if it goes into the dark place, it still has the capacity to come out. Because I wow. think a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of times people get scared. They don't want to do this because they're like, what well, if I get stuck in there? And so that's it teaches like, that. Overall in this world, I mean, that's one thing that I've really been like kind of studying lately and, and watching is that we're so like, oh my gosh, we're only going to focus on the good. We're only going to really give all of our energy if it's totally, you know, just effortless and just amazing and patriotic. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we even, we look at history and we only really learn the good stuff. I mean, I've done so much ancestry work and it just blows me away. I'm like, holy cow, this is like true history and really none none of us good. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, but also, like you know, I've been studying the Gnostic Gospels and that's like a huge part of of that, you know, what they teach, but that's not our regular teaching. Um, Like from, I was born Catholic, very deeply rooted in my family. So it's always just like, don't even acknowledge that bad. We're going to only be good, (laughs) you know, and I don't think that that's natural. That's something even our our physical bodies really want to accept. Right. I mean, that's what I call toxic positivity. It's it's yeah. like it, you you're you're nothing in life is bright and sunny all the time. Day it goes from day to night. We go from inhale to exhale. There's always expansion. There's always contraction, and that's a natural flow of life. You know, I like to look on the bright side. Like even when I'm at a dark place, I could say, right. okay, I'm, I'm processing something. So that's good. Now that doesn't mean I feel good. That just means, okay, yeah. I know this is coming up for a reason. Right. And so for that, you know, there's that silver lining. Like I know yeah. this 
shitty right now, but <laughs> I know it's coming up for a good reason. But you allow yourself to do it. You're not like, I'm going to numb it. I'm going to ignore it. I'm not going to pretend right. it didn't, it's not happening to me, which avoidance right. became like my, like I was a pro at avoidance. I was so right. good at it. I mean, right. the world could be blowing up and I'm like, it's okay. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know but I have learned so much through the past few years about that duality and accepting it and when you do that what happens is I think is actually you disconnect from some of that fear that you aren't even acknowledging that's actually running rapid within you and that's exactly right that's what I was saying earlier about everybody wants to go here right so they're living, oh, I'm so positive. I'm like, I don't want to look at that. And I'm avoiding and all that stuff. But your body is still processing it. So yes. if you've not dealt with the fear or the shame or the guilt or the you know lack of trust for other human beings, then that's still playing in your nervous system. Mm-hmm. The, you're not getting away from it. You're just not thinking about it. Yeah. So it's still, and that's again, where a lot of the you know manifestation of, physical disease comes from it's Mm -hmm. it's this inability to process those repressed and or unresolved emotions oh that's so true let me tell you I had an experience and our listeners will know because it was such a big deal you know I'm like you you think you think you've come so far (laughs) and then all of a sudden wait a minute where'd that come from it was in the (laughs) middle of the night too It was like, I've always, and this is like TMI to some people, but not people who listen to our podcast, but you know, I, I've always hated to be woken up in the middle of the night to have sex. I mean, like Mm -hmm. I immediately like clam up rejection, mad, just get it over with. I want nothing to do with pleasure. This is not something I want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you know, my partner, like he always consents, you know, that there's this rejection was one night, well, actually, I should mm. mention the week before I was teaching a Reiki class and we were very much focused on, you know, just sitting with where we might have pain. Well, I had a lot of lower back pain. So I was getting mm. all this attention to this space. And I was really kind of honing into the womb and the sacral chakra with the reproductive system. I'm kind of going through menopause. I am going through menopause. But I mean, just all of these things were Oh, I wasn't then though, but I was having a lot of stuff at the sacral chakra lower back focusing there. Well, I mean, I don't believe in coincidences, but <laughs> like that night he woke me up and I'm just like, get it over with. And then afterwards, I'm literally just sitting there with my eyes wide open. And I remembered when I was 11 years old mm. and I was like, all of a sudden it's like, I realized I had an experience where I had been violated. You know, it's not Mm -hmm. that I didn't remember, but I had never thought that it had affected me. And in Mm -hmm. this moment, and I had talked about it. I remember even saying stupid stuff like, well, you know, it's so weird. Never really affected me. Um, Yeah. In that (laughs) moment, I could feel every muscle in my body remembering it at that moment, tightening up, rejecting, holding in as much I could. And It was, it was crazy. And then I'm like sitting there, my eyes are wide open. My partner looks over. He's like, do you have something to say? Are you okay? Which he would never ask me like four in the morning. We're not going to talk. (laughs) Go to bed. So I told him, you know, he's like, well, you know that you're safe with me. I mean, I've known him since second grade. Of course. I was like, yeah, you're right. I do. I was like, but my body didn't. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was Mm -hmm. like, this is what's been happening. So the next day I sat with, he had said, you know, I am safe and all these things. So I felt like I really brought a lot of awareness to it, did a lot of healing. So I'm like, you need to wake me up and try it again. He's like, oh, fuck no. Oh, no way. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, you have to. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, to make a long story short, I mean, it did go away. I mean, it was really miraculous. Yes. Yeah. And and I had no idea it was there. So how much are we carrying that we don't even realize that is affecting our life? Yeah. I love that story because that, again, it points to this idea of the embodied experience versus the intellectual understanding. Mm -hmm. And I feel like so many people, not everyone, of course, but a lot of people have an intellectual understanding. Like, yes, I know my parents did this and this happened, blah, blah, blah. But the bot, but the, but it's disconnected from the 
physical experience of it. And that's actually, so to, to, the, to your point of how do we know, so that's one of the things that I do, which I, I shared, I think, with you, um, is this idea of character structure. Now, character structure is this idea that when we have intense and or chronic enough experiences to, during developmental times in our lives, so specifically in utero to 10, 11, 12 years old, so when the body is really uh, developing and the nervous system is really developing, that when those experiences are unresolved, they get trapped into the tissue posture and musculature of the body. And so by looking at a person's posture, then you can start understanding what their psychological and emotional and developmental issues are. Now, of course, the details are not known by just reading a person's body, but the emotions that are unresolved and that live in the body are. It's really amazing because for me, well, once you learn how to do this, it's helpful to bypass the conscious ego mind, right? Because the conscious mind, the ego mind is always, it's trying to keep you alive. It's trying to keep you defended. And so of course it's never going to be like, oh yeah, I was molested and now I'm going to feel this mm. because it doesn't, <laughs> want you to feel it. Yeah. Right. it doesn't want you to feel that because it could be overwhelming for the system. Again, it's not good that this happens, right, but right. It, it's a good way to understand what's going on in your body outside of what the brain or the, you know, consciousness is saying, because uh, this consciousness is always going to try to protect you. Does that all make sense? Yeah. yeah. That is so what happens. And it is yeah. true. Another thing that I notice is how we're so amazing. First of all, <laughs> we're just like such ama amazing creatures. <laughs> but you know, when you were talking about body language, of course, you know, there's the obvious, like when you're hunched over and like protecting mm -hmm. But it's almost yeah. like we're protecting our heart in some way, you know, that heart yeah. chakra, or yeah. like you're nervous and your hands go over your stomach or when you're just appalled and your hands go over your mouth, your speech, right? List, right? Exactly. It's like we have these natural feeling reaction that our hands do, you know, it's right. like, but it's beyond muscle memory, right? Of course it's muscle memory, right. but it seems to be beyond that. It's a spiritual right. memory. It's like remembering, right. of, you know, something primal in us. And that's exactly right. It's, it's a remember. Yes, it is. We see it through the physical body. We see it through the musculature, but the imprint is a universal imprint. Okay. And so like, for example, uh, if somebody is scared, if you go across time and across culture, unless they're a psychopath, they're going to do the same, you know, they're, huh, they're going to, yeah. their body is going to react in a similar way. And this is uh. that like, the universal imprint that mm. when you smile at someone across culture, across time, you know what that means. Yeah. You know, you yeah. might not know them, but you know what that means. You may not speak their language, but you know what that means. Right. And that's the body language. That's the beauty of it in a way is I don't need to know your story. I can read your story on your body. Oh, uh, I love that. You no. know, I came across, I think it was something on Gaia and I, I'm, I wish I could quote it, but I can't remember, but it was saying that when we have 22 chromosomes that are identical, all of us. And then that was yep. like the 23rd was your male or female. Right. And I was like, wow, that's so amazing. But you know, when you're saying like, we have these things about us, like even, you know, when you comfort someone and your hand just goes towards them, you know, that seems like the hands are very healing, like Reiki and other energy yeah. and is. And now I was talking to a doctor not too long ago where they were saying doctors used to do a lot more hands-on with hands, you know, and now yeah. you have, oh, don't get too close to your clients or, you know, you've got all these rules and right. things that are going against our natural process of healing. I completely like that whole touching in contact with people is, is such an important part of healing as I mentioned earlier, this idea of interpersonal neurobiology, which is this idea that your nervous system develops in relationship to someone else. First, because you're in utero when you're with your mom's nervous yeah. system and with your caregivers. So That's why they put the baby on the mom's, right? That exactly. First touch, right? Okay. Exactly. And so because trauma will happen in relationship with someone else, mm. there's always 
again, because you're taking care of the child. And if you're not giving the child what it needs in that particular moment, it could translate that into some sort of trauma, even if it's not big Mm -hmm. T trauma like abuse, but the child will not have had that need met. So anyway, I, I say all this because that means then healing happens in relationship also. So you can't heal trauma that was born out of trauma related to people on your own. Mm. And so that's actually the test is when you're in groups, are you going through your trauma response or your patterned responses, or is it something different and new? So anyway, I I say all that to kind of circle back around to healing touch is very important. It's a useful tool to get the body to understand things in a new way, not just the brain. So I'll share this with you. um, Also TMI, but I'll share it with you. I went through a very, very dark place a number of years ago and my partner, he was trying in different ways to help me get out of it. And the one thing that helped, I say would probably, I would say probably saved my life was every night when I was going to sleep, he would just gently pet me Mm. for 20 minutes to an hour, however long it took. What that did is taught my nervous system Mm -hmm. that I'm safe. safe. And he could have said, you're safe, you're safe, you're safe, you're safe a gazillion times. And while my brain knew it, Mm -hmm. my body didn't know it. it. And so just that. That makes me almost want to cry. You know, my son with autism sometimes will actually come sit next to me and his sister will do it too and say, will you, will you tickle my arm? He just wants to process because he is a little hypotonic. Like he could get hurt. He lost every tooth and I had no idea. I'm like, what happened to your teeth? (laughs) Right. You know, I always think of him because with his, it's so obvious, but we all have these things, right? Yep. And we get cut off from it, like just through conditioning and socialization and modern life. And we get cut off from it. But there are, I think there are people that are still very connected to that stuff. And it comes out maybe in a way that society isn't used to, but that that's actually a beautiful gift. You know, Mm -hmm. it's a beautiful gift to be that sensitive. Yeah. And so, you know, know, one thing on your website that also stuck out is healing the disconnect. And that's exactly, you know, what we've been talking about. So one of my fields of study is called uh, psychoneuroimmunology, how our thoughts affect our nervous system, affect our immune system, our endocrine system, our metabolism, so on and so forth. So, um, so back to what, so you were saying you, you've suffered from fibromyalgia. So what that, again, I don't, I don't know your story that much, but what that says to me is that there's a part of you, and again, it might not be conscious you, it might be subconscious you, mm-hmm. which rejects its own self. And so it, it's, probably some sort of belief that was, you know, you took on at a certain age in your life as a defense. If, Mm -hmm. if I reject this part of myself, then I'm going to be in alignment with my family values or how my family functions or or whatever the case is. And then it's going to manifest in a condition. Again, fibromyalgia may have come from not knowing much of your story, (laughs) but that's no, but you did. That's, that is what happened. You know, I mean, I'm from a very Southern family, deeply rooted, you know, women just took care of their kids, served the men. And I was right. trying really hard to live up to that. And right. it just, I, I spiraled out of control because my body didn't agree with that. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I'm definitely the first person to break that, you know, and I don't right. have pain anymore, but it was painful going through the process. That's absolutely for sure. Exactly. So So your body was saying no. So your body was saying no, because you couldn't in some ways say the no. So your body was like, all right, (laughs) we're we're going to do this. (laughs) Yep. We broke the mold with that for sure. But, you know, I have learned to anytime pain comes in, instead of just take a pill, you know, really sitting with it and and loving it and nurturing it and trying to get to the root of it. Because I feel like it is a message, just like emotions. Same. Exactly. Same, same. Exactly. I mean, if I could give you some questions you might want to explore with it outside of just sitting with it and uh, soothing it, but like ask, what are you trying to teach me? Mm -hmm. Um, And also when you feel the pain, going into the pain, like feel wherever part of your body 
you feel it, go into it, ask it, how old are you? It's going to tell you. And most often it's going to be I was three in utero, four years old. And so you see that this pain started before it manifested in this condition. So just exploring it along those lines. And what do you need right now? I have a deeper question then on that note. Yep. It seems like most of that might be, you know, what I experienced that maybe I didn't realize was in my body. But what about the genetic stuff? Because I know that's been a huge part of my journey healing those things. And I am a hundred percent proof that there was things in my subconscious mind did not know existed that once I brought awareness to, I was able to actually change my results. So that's the patterns and reactions that are subconscious. Yeah. So while we may not be able to access the explicit memory from ancestral stuff, Mm -hmm the implicit memory is still being played out through our genes, through our nervous system. So that again, it might not be as clear cut, but it will play out. If you can let go of needing to have the explicit or narrative. So what you're saying, you, you can get through the first layer, that superficial one. Exactly then you can access access the implicit memory Mm -hmm. that could be from this lifetime that could be from your ancestors I'll give you an example so my grandparents on my father's side uh, were in Europe during World War II were Jewish and so they were hiding out in the forest for many years and they were part of the resistance right now so I know this to be true and as a young kid I had this recurring dream of me and my father walking down the street in the Bronx where I grew up and we'd just be walking down the street and then Doberman Pinchers would be chasing us. And that mm-hmm. was the dream. They never caught us, yeah. but I, that was the dream. Here. And I had it for years and years. Right. I just thought this was a dream. I had a weird recurring dream. Maybe I picked it up also from like, I don't know, a memory, my grandparents, who knows, right? Yeah. Then I read last year, I read a book, Interviews of Children of Holocaust Survivors. And there was one guy who told the story of he would have a recurring dream of being chased by Doberman Pinchers. Wow. I mean, that's even more insane. I don't know that we're related or not. I don't think we are. But that dream, that fear, that and that specific manifestation in dream form Mm. in some way has a trajectory Mm. in this population is mind blowing because that's right. even, that's not even genes. That's like the right. subconscious of like, this, like, yeah. Th- yeah. So that's even more insane really to think that's about, but, but that can but, happen. Yes. Yes. That. Yeah. And so, but back to your question of that, if we can get away from the need to understand the explicit or know the explicit memory, the okay. implicit memory will be there presenting itself in your body in some way. So some, some people believe, and I've been actually, this has been put before me a few times that I'm just not sure how I believe. I don't know what I feel about it, but some people believe you don't actually need to know the physical thing that you don't have to know the whole story that happened. We just have to know where it's at, know that it was bad and let's get rid of it. How do you feel about that? Um, so I think that it's, if we're talking about healing the body, Mm-hmm. We don't need to know the story. Okay. We can he- we can heal the body. Okay. I think that there is a benefit though in and again it's not always available. Like sometimes our trauma happens in utero. You're never going to remember that. Ugh. Um but I think there there are times where it it is in some way corroborating or validating, let's say. If it's more validating to 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 be like, oh, that happened to me. And therefore, like, these are the things that happened as a result of that. Right. You can um, see it playing out in your life. Yeah. So, so you're able to see it. Yeah. So I, I can see there is something about validating the experience in knowing that it. was for me. Right. And mm-hmm. at the same time, I think that it's 
you know, we don't necessarily need to know it. And sometimes we don't have access to it. So that's not even, that's not even going to happen. You know, that's interesting. You said your group because, you know, we never think about that, but my daughter, when she was born, you know, there was like this thing where she couldn't breathe and they took her away right away. And I had done a past life regression with her one time and she had had this recurring dream that she was naked and there was, she would wake up with this weird taste in her mouth. But when I brought her back in the past life regression right. and I started her through the womb, we didn't right. get past that because that was so significant to her. She was like, oh my God, I have this taste in my mouth. I know this taste. I, I This is the taste in my dreams. Oh my right. God, this is what it is. I mean, it was so big right. for her. And right. one thing that she had connected, so she was able to connect something, right? Right. And what right. she connected was that many times she feels alone even though she's in a house full of people right. and she felt like this disconnect. And I, you know, and we, we talked about it and she goes, I think it's because they took me away from you. Like right away. I went from being with you forever. And then you were disconnected from me and I was by myself, like for a long time, for hours and hours. And I think that really must've affected me. They can affect you like inside the womb. And trauma for sure can affect you. Of course it can affect you. If you think about it, just what your daughter said, again, we're back to the kids being geniuses, (laughs) being (laughs) so aware of things. But if you can imagine, yes, she's inside of you for nine months. And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden she's, you know, aggressively expelled from your body because birth is is pretty aggressive, (laughs) right? Right. And she's in this, like, there's lights, there's everything, there's sounds, there's new things and everything. And then she's taken away from the system, from the womb, from everything that she's been used to. How long was she away from you after she gave, after you gave birth? Well, I think it was like a good four to six hours, which is a long time. For a baby, that's a really Mm -hmm. long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because if you can think of now, if we can put ourselves in the place of that newborn baby who for nine months totally safe warm got all of her needs met she was like just chilling (laughs) like and then all of a sudden for four to six hours ripped away from this safe place how much fear would that cause that child? Well, and guess what? It, I just remembered she was left in the birth canal too long and she choked on the amniotic fluid. That's what that taste was. I mean so you see that is amazing. But she was only yeah. really experiencing this in her dream. And then I brought her back to that space where right. she was able, almost like a dream space, a right. state, right? right? She was right. able to actually connect with that yeah. when I brought it to her attention. I, I didn't actually, I mean, I bring a lot of people through that womb first, but yeah. I didn't know yeah. it was going to be that significant for her. We didn't even get hardly past. Yeah. I mean, it was like, okay, but that's it. We're good. There it <laughs> is. So then like, if we could connect it back, right? So making those connections help to validate the experience. So it's like, Oh, that's where it for, it's from. So it does help it penetrate to a certain level. And then the, Im, the embodiment, the body work is to get the body to understand that and to get the body mm-hmm. to, to get, so right, okay, she made the connection. Oh, that's where the taste from, comes from. That's where the sound is. That's where the anxiety is. Okay, so right, now I made all the connection, okay. right. but now how do I get my body to recognize I'm safe? So that's where it's like, okay, so now there's some body stuff that can be done to get the body to understand that. And that's the real healing, right? It's like, we made this connection in our head and now we have to make also the connection in our body. And I wonder now, and I bet she would agree, she's very mature. She's 23, but she's a Pisces, always been, you know, very intuitive. I love Pisces. I'm a Taurus, but I've always been attracted to Pisces. I, I understand them. (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, she says she likes weighted blankets, mm. you know, she's got a thing for blankets. She's got a thing yeah. for soft stuff. She's definitely um, yeah. sensory when it comes to touch and all of these things. Yeah. And guess what her love language is? Spending time with people. Ah, and yeah, right. she was taken away. Children, she's the only right. one. In fact, when I was trying to figure out what their love languages were I actually when she walked in the door she was like 16 I gave her this huge hug and she was like what are you doing 
And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, well, that's not your love language then. She's like, why did you just do that? Don't do it again. But then like later on, I said, how do you know I love you? And she was like, I don't know. I like when we spend time together and go on adventures and yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. so yeah. interesting. God, yeah. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you do for your clients? You know, I know that you also work with their health as well. Right. Basically, when I work with people, I work with them on five different levels. So we work with the physical bodies. Are you sleeping? Are you, what are you eating? Uh, what are you drinking? Are you doing movement? And it's not just, again, fitness related stuff. It's actually because the nutrients you put on your body can have an effect on the way you think and feel and mm -hmm. your movement and back to the character armor. If you're locked in certain positions, if we start getting the body to move in new ways, that's also going to change the way you think and feel. So body stuff. Then we work on emotional patterns, psychological patterns, spiritual patterns. Sometimes I, when I talk about spirit, depending on the audience, I might say spiritual needs or purpose. Like, do you feel like you have a sense of purpose? Mm -hmm. um, and then connection, community environment. So do you, you know, cause those are going to have an effect too. If you feel you're doing everything wonderfully, and you don't feel like you have a network of people or a place that you feel safe, then all of this is great, but you're going to still, it's still going to affect you. So typically I will work with people when they come to me for an issue, whether it's some sort of needing healing from trauma, having some sort of pattern in their life that they can't get out of or break free from disease or disorder manifesting in the body. And then we look at the broad view of all of these different inputs mm -hmm. and we start adjusting them to be more in alignment with each other and with the true self. What I find is that when we start looking at all these and making adjustments to all of them, then whatever is showing up, whether it's a pattern, whether it's disease or pain manifesting in the body, whatever it is, those mm -hmm. start to heal. Yeah. So so that's how I work with people is looking at the big picture and how all of those things are affecting the physical body. Yeah. You're like the multidimensional doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Love this. <laughs> right? No, it's yeah. what it reminds me of. But you know, I use the discernment exercise so often to get people to, I can look, you know, close your eyes. I want you, you know, imagine something positive and feel it in your body. Yeah. I mean, close your eyes, imagine something, you know, imagine you hate that thing and see how it feels. Why we are not taught this from the very beginning, I, I don't know, but I'm hoping that we are shifting into this. I mean, we can trust our bodies to always guide us. And now it's time for Break That Shit Down. I think, knock on wood, that people are becoming much more aware yeah. And maybe they don't know how to do it, but they're also <laughs> recognizing that their body, there's an innate knowing if we just kind of pause and listen and give the body what it needs. Not, yeah. And when I say body, I don't just mean physical body, but emotional body, psychological, all those, that it will do what it needs to do. Um, so I do think things are shifting oh, at the same oh. time you know, it takes work and people often want a quick solution and this stuff doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight. There's consistent work that has to be put in to create in the body. So it's like, I can see it. Like people are more open, want to do it, want to, you know, yeah. take their health in their own hands. But also, can I just have a pill for this, <laughs> you know? And also it's, it's work, but it is not like, it's not like, okay, go out and run a marathon. It's just small little adjustments every single day and small little moments of, huh, I just reacted. I don't know why I reacted like that. Be curious about it. Okay, what, what am I making this mean right now? So it's not, again, you're not lifting a building over your head like kind of work. <laughs> it's like just little, little things every single day that add up over the long term. Ah, uh, we need more doctors like you. <laughs> <laughs> we need pe more people like you i'm so glad that you came on to sense of soul yeah. i really appreciate it 
Where can Thank everybody you so find much. you? They can find me on my website, stacyberman.com. And then my Instagram handle is stacybermanphd, um, S-T-A-C-Y-B-E-R-M-A-N. I just say that because most people like to put ease in my name and that's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> you do so many amazing things, plant medicine, you're a sex expert. Yeah. I read an article, it was so good. You're, you also do Reiki, you do all the things. Yeah. But- yeah. Um, I think that you bring so much wisdom and thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Hannah. Nice to meet thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being with us today. We hope you will come back next week. If you like what you hear, don't forget to rate, like, and subscribe. Thank you. We rise to lift you up. Thanks for listening.